<laughs> it's snowing pretty damn hard at the moment. I've been hiking for most of the morning and I've basically come to a dead end. I'm kind of heading up this one good size drainage and I've on, been on a fairly decent older trail uh, most of the way. And it basically, yeah, I just got cliffed out right at the edge of the creek. So I've, I kind of dumped my pack and hiked around just on my snowshoes for a good 10 or 20 minutes. Was not able to find a way around. I think I'm gonna have to head up into the timber. Seems to be the only logical choice. Anyways, I'm getting a bit ahead of myself. So for some context, um, we are in Northern BC, Northwestern BC specifically. We're in the back country. Um, really good mountain goat country. Uh, pretty rugged. This is the first time I've ever been here before. So DIY solo hunt, um, I'll be here. I've got seven full hunting days if I need them. It'd be great if I could get it done in less, but we'll kind of play that as she goes. So I'll do my best to document this hunt and I hope you enjoy the ride. However hard you think snowshoeing through the mountains with a 70 pound pack on is multiply that by three and you're getting close to how hard this actually is. Man, so I've been turned around three times now. This is the type of stuff And I'm trying to walk through. It's pretty steep. Um, it's doable for sure. I think I finally learned my lesson. I keep trying to break new trail with my pack on, not knowing exactly where I'm going. And I get so far and I just have to stop. I dump the pack. I'll I can cover ground super fast with no pack on. I run up a couple hundred yards and I realize there's just no way I'm gonna get any further with the pack on. Now, listen, if I was going to kill a goat or get a goat out, I mean, it, it, it is technically possible to get through here, but it's like, I'm miles from where I wanna go. I'm not walking through 10 more miles of this shit. It would take me a week just to get there. So I have to do my recce with no pack. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna back down out of this gnarly shit. I think potentially my best chance is to try and cross this river down here. So I'm gonna backtrack down to the last known good spot with a decent trail. I'm gonna dump everything there and then I'm just gonna explore. Maybe this is as far as I get today and maybe I gotta explore for the rest of the day to find a way through here. And I think once I kind of clicked my head over into like recce mode, I'm like, oh, okay, this is doable, I can do this. So that's the game plan. Backtrack, dump gear, find a route. All right, I came about a mile up the river from where I dropped my pack. I was able to traverse it fairly easily once I found a spot to get across. It's a little bit sketch, but I'm gonna see if I can find some wood to lay down a bit of a makeshift bridge. And then just back here, I was able to back, cross back over onto the side that I wanna be on. So it's given me enough confidence that I can definitely move up some more because I can see a good, you know, quarter mile in front of me. Um, and I know I can get at least that far and it's super foggy and snowy right now, so I can't see shit, but I can see the openings of a bunch of chutes, and I feel like if I get up this next quarter of a mile, I'll be able to sit down in the bottom and glass up into these chutes if this snow breaks. Um, worst case scenario, I might even just set up camp up there for the night. It's not nearly as far as I wanted to get, but I grossly underestimated how hard it would be to cover ground in here but super good news that I got up this far. I was starting to get a bit stressed out there for a while. So I'm gonna go back, 
get the pack, ferry everything up here, and keep on keeping on. So I took some shit at the beginning of the year because, you know, I'm training for this bodybuilding show. I weigh 260 pounds right now. And everybody was like, oh, you're not gonna be able to hike for shit. Hiking is a little more challenging at 260. I'll give you that. Here's what I will say. There's no fucking way I would have been physically capable of doing that if it hadn't been for all the strength training lately. That log is heavy as fuck. It was half buried in the snow. I literally had to pick it up straight up out of the ground. Nothing to grab onto, but I feel way better about that crossing now that I've got the, like, the one step in the middle to kind of help me over. All right, I'm just about to set up my tent. I'll do a little video afterwards, um, but first I want to talk about tent site selection on a hunt like this. And normally, you're concerned about things like uh, wind or bears or a variety of other things when you're trying to choose a campsite. Proximity to water, perhaps. My number one concern on this hunt is avalanches. The whole walk in, I've seen these mini shoots coming down. In fact, if you look right across, see all this giving way and then that kind of shoot coming down right there there's some more over there that are kind of fogged out but it's like a legitimate concern here so let me back up for a second i've tried to pick a spot that's not right up against the edge of the bluff like there's a flat area before it gets to me and there's solid trees with no signs of, of shoots from previous years or previous slides up above me. I was gonna go back into the trees, but then that puts me right on the bluff. Um, so I've decided to stay out here. So what I've done is basically kicked a big kind of flat area and that's where I'll set up the tent. Uh, creek is right over there about a hundred yards so water's nearby and tons of fresh snow and I brought lots of fuel so water is not a concern it's funny how there's always like variables of concern on a hunt but they switch you know one of my last hunts water was the hardest thing to find um, and this is the thing I have to worry about least here so I'm maybe four miles deep a very difficult day I'll give more of an update once I get the tent set up I want to get everything ready before dark all right All right, camp's all set up. Let's have a little tour. Okay, this is the Hilleberg Solo. Um, a little alcove here that I can kind of cook in the morning and keep a little things. It's not really big enough for my backpack, but I bought a dry bag for that. And then here's what inside looks like. I'm running the Kafaru Slick Bag X-Ped um, Hyper Light Winter Down Mat. And then I got an extra Thermarest underneath that. Not too bad for room. I mean, it's not huge, but it, it's bomb proof. Like I could take three feet of snow on this thing and it wouldn't collapse. So I kind of sacrificed room for weight and durability. So it's still a little bit early. I wasn't sure how much, how long it was gonna take me to set up camp. And to be honest, I am just beat. So, I am going to boil some water, make some dinner, chill out, rest up. I had a quick little recce down where I'm going to be headed in the morning. And as long as this fog lifts, there's a huge bowl that's kind of looking right at me that looks very promising. So hopefully it's a good day tomorrow.
All right, morning of day two, and we're headed back down this river bottom. It looks like it's gonna be a little bit more clear today. It's hard to tell right now. Um, I have these little shoots in front of me that are visible. See these guys? So basically I'm kind of creeping around this corner and just glassing the shoots as I go. Um, and I know if it's visible, as soon as I get around this big bend, there's that huge basin at the end that I'm hoping is gonna be glassable, but it's looking good. All right, here we go. It's crazy the power of these avalanches, man. It's like almost every couple hundred meters now I'm coming against a spot where it's just come down and gone clear across the river. I can't even imagine getting buried in one of these. That is like my version of a nightmare. Super impressive though. All right, make an okay time. I just can't believe how much harder this is than I thought it was gonna be. I mean, it is absolutely grueling. I've been sweating my bag off all morning and I've maybe made it a mile since camp. I think I have to take whatever kind of estimates I had for distance covered that were in my head and just cut them in half. I've got a goal about two miles up where I think I'd like to make camp because if it takes me two full days to get back that far, I don't think I want to drag camp any further than that. And then I can day hunt from there. I mean, I still haven't seen any goats. However, on that note, there is, things are looking up. It's gonna to be tough to see it on camera, but right up there is like a huge ridge. I'm gonna sit here and glass and have some coffee, catch my breath, and, and you know maybe turn up some goats. If not, that's right at the confluence of another river and that's the goal where I'm gonna try and make camp tonight. All right, boys and girls, we officially got some goats. They are technically on top of the world. <laughs> They're about like, I don't know, 5,500 feet uh, elevation above where I am now. And to be honest, it's like a fucking moonscape up there. There's really no play that I can see from here um, on those goats, but that's not the point. The point is we're in some fucking action. That's the uplifting part. When you're slogging through this shit and you're not even seeing animals, it, you, you just consistently doubting yourself. But I had a feeling this was the area when I was going to start to see goats. That's not based on any experience or knowledge. It was just a gut intuition. And I just broke out the spotter, panned. The, the, the top of the mountain was in cloud for the longest time. And then it broke. And I just put the spotter up. And it was like one of those moments. It could have just been a puff of snow. It could have been a thousand different puffs of snow. But I knew it wasn't. It just, it had this yellowish tinge to it. And boom, there's a group of like... I don't know, seven, eight, nine goats. So super good news. Definitely gonna be easier to stay motivated for the afternoon, push on through to the campsite, stop and glass every now and then. And yeah, look for some more goats.
All right, it's just after four o'clock. Just stopped for a coffee and a snack, catch my breath. Got one last push, maybe like half a mile to where I'd like to set up camp for tonight. Um, a bit of an unfortunate circumstance. I, I broke or severely bent my snowshoe. I'm, yeah, there's not a whole lot I can do about it. If that thing breaks, I'm fucked because there's no way out of here without snowshoes. Um, I'm going to have to be more careful. Between me and the pack, it's 330 pounds, and I just don't think the metal on these snowshoes is kind of designed for that type of abuse. So I'm going to try and take it a bit more easy. Um, maybe try and see if I can rig something up at camp tonight to kind of offer it some more stability or, or toughen it up a little bit. But other than that, day's been going pretty good. Covered a decent amount of ground today. Saw that one batch of goats stopped and glassed two other times. Didn't turn up anything else. So, all right, one last push. All right, I wanted to go over my sleeping pad just because um, I've never used one of these inflating systems before and for the reason that I just don't like carrying the extra weight and I never really saw much of a purpose. But this sleeping pad is a little bit unique. Like I mentioned last night, this is the XPED Winter Hyperlight Down. So there is actual down inside this sleeping pad. This is the first one I've ever had like this. Um, it's funny because you can actually feel it like it's it's puffy um, even when it's deflated. So for most sleeping pads, I don't really give a shit about these inflationary devices. I would just exhale directly into the sleeping pad. But if I do that with this down one, I am going to get condensation inside the sleeping pad and then that's going to get the down wet and it is going to negate having down there in there in the first place. Um, Sorry if I'm not stringing sentences together appropriately. I am insanely exhausted and I'm doing my best just to be coherent. So you take this little dry bag, you hook it up to the, to the sleeping pad, you just kind of shake it full of air, close the top, squeeze it in. You do that seven or eight times and you've got a full sleeping pad. It's actually a really sweet system. you get the idea essentially with four or five of these little baggies full my sleeping pad is now fully inflated and I didn't have to blow any condensation in there no liquid got in there whatsoever and the down will stay protected plus I didn't get dizzy and see stars in the process so that's always a plus kitchen sponge for the win okay so morning of day three about to get going a little bit behind schedule today this is where i'm going to set up camp for a little bit so i just wanted to like get everything organized um let me show you camp real quick and then we'll get into the day's plans so i came into the trees this time there's a lot of snow predicted for the next little bit here's the setup and for anyone who's ever slept on a bit of an angle, it absolutely destroys your night's sleep. You sleep for like 10, 20 minutes at a time, roll off the pad, wake up, rinse and repeat. It's garbage. So really dialed in the pad. Now there's a couple reasons why this is going to have to be my base camp for the rest of the trip. One, took me two days to get in this far. Think I can make it out in one day, but that's not a guarantee. I'm a little bit nervous to go in too much deeper and not have enough time to get back out. 
Two, and this is kind of more important, I, it, upon further inspection this morning, I've actually severely bent both of my snowshoes. So you can see here, like there, that is not, this one in particular, that is not how a snowshoe is supposed to look. So, as I've mentioned previously, pretty sure just the combined weight was just too much for those to handle. That being said, I'm gonna pack up, get ready to go, and go try to kill a goat. So, I'm trudging along here and having these like thoughts to myself. And I used to always think that time and distance were the variables that impacted your psychology and your emotional well-being the most when you were off on, on these hunts. And what, what I mean is I thought the further you, that you were, uh, the longer that you were away from your family and home and the further that you were away, the more difficult that it, that it became. And I mean, I've hunted hard before, but this like pure exhaustion that you get from walking through this heavy snow in snowshoes with a big pack, I've, I'm gonna add another variable. That's exactly what I just mentioned, exhaustion. It is wild, the emotional roller coaster that I'm going through right now. And it's funny because I've talked about this on the podcast a lot lately and I think that's why it's top of mind for me and I'm able to just observe it and not sink into it. But it's only my third day in here. This should not be a challenging psychological event, but it is. Um, yeah, I'm like kind of lonely. I'm feeling kind of depressed. I keep thinking about my broken snowshoes and my broken camera. Okay, there's two reasons why I want to bring this up. Number one is because people are always asking me to like dig deeper into this kind of stuff for the podcast and they're looking at doing trips like this and they want to know what to expect. And it, so I just... I wanna share kind of what I'm going through so that other people, when they get out here, it's like, yeah, this is normal. You just push through that. Here's the other component though. Like why? You know, I have the money to go on a guided goat hunt if I really wanted to just kill a goat. And I can't help but think that obviously I must believe that there's some kind of growth to be had through this challenge. Otherwise, I'm just an idiot and there's really no point in doing this whatsoever. And it was just all, you know, what am I even going on about? Like, what's the point in even, in even having this discussion? I personally think that self-awareness is the key to like inner kind of growth or whatever you want to call it, to some type of, of evolution and, and maturation. So if I can be aware of my emotional state, that gives me the power to make decisions in opposition to my emotional state. Let me say that again. When I'm aware of how I feel, I can make decisions that go against how I feel. Case in point, I'm lonely, I'm tired, I'm cold, I'm wet, I wanna go home. Without self-awareness, I just turn around and go home. With self-awareness, I say, okay, no problem, man. You're tired, you're hungry, you're cold, and you're wet. No big deal, now keep moving. Yeah, doesn't matter. You're allowed to feel those things as long as you keep moving. And I don't know, like I said before, it's not just a goat hunt. When I set out on this hunt, the goal was to plan what was for me the most challenging hunt I'd ever been on in, in every way possible. And I certainly succeeded because like I said, it's only day three and already I'm like, man, what were you thinking? So I just wanted to you know, share where I'm at and what's going on. And it flip-flops, like you go from feeling like that to looking up at the mountains and just being like, this is crazy. Like who gets to be in here and see this kind of stuff? That alone is worth the effort. Anyways, time to go look for some goats. All right, quick little update. Just stopped for lunch. I maybe made it a mile and a half since camp. I think the goal today is just to try and break trail as far as I can. Because I think basically by the time I come around this kind of big bend that I'm trying to come around, it's gonna be pretty close to the time when I'm gonna turn back and get back to camp. But 
I think what took me six or seven hours to break should only take me an hour and a half to walk back. It's finding the route and breaking through the snow that's the hardest part. So then tomorrow I can bomb back up this trail and hopefully break another mile or two of trail. And then I should be in the really goaty country, which isn't leaving me much time, but I mean, it's just, there's just all I can do to it. So this is what I'm looking at. So I'm trying to get around this big bend and then essentially on this side, there should be a whole bunch of steep canyony shit that I'm hoping is gonna hold some goats. I've seen one batch of goats so far, but they were so high up, there's really no point in even looking at them just because you'd need a helicopter to get up there. All right, I've made it as far as I can for today. I'm kind of at the head of this glacier bowl that I'll show you in a minute. It took me all day to get here. It's 3.30 now. I'm gonna glass for an hour and hope I can make it back to camp in two hours. I'm following a trail, so it shouldn't be that bad. But so here's my setup. Got all my stuff out here, glass and stuff. Gonna make a cup of coffee, have a seat, and then this, is where I'm at. And this, you can't see it on this camera, but there's like a blue glacier lake up there. It's just friggin' wild. I'm gonna try and get some footage of it with the, with the phone scope if I can. It's nutty. That's basically as far as I can go anyways. I'm not gonna make it up and over that saddle. That's just too intense. So that's it for today, man. Sit here, glass for maybe an hour, hour and a half, depending on how energetic I feel, and then head back to camp. All right, well, that got shitty pretty quick. Um, I don't know where fog came in. Fucking snow just everywhere. I just visibility is shot. So I was going to pack it up in about 15, 20 minutes anyways. So I am happy to let the snow call it the end of my day. Hike back to camp and try and make it out this way again tomorrow. Except maybe further and glass for longer. day four and I thought it might be kind of cool to take a little look at what my morning ritual tends to be like. So I wake up kind of wherever I wake up. You can't really start hiking until about 7.30 anyways. It's about six o'clock now. I was just done sleeping. So wake up and the first order of business is coffee and breakfast. So I've got the MSR reactor there which has turned out to work out really good. I got a little bit of Starbucks Instant Via brewing over here, the inReach. Just did my morning check-in, which I'll elaborate on in a second. And then here's breakfast. I love, I'm gonna turn this around for a sec, this Mountain Berry Oatmeal from Peak Refuel. It's delicious, I, I love this stuff. Sometimes I put an extra protein in it these days because there's so much water around here. I've been saving that protein shake for later in the day. So I'll sit in here, maybe listen to a bit of a podcast for 20 or 30 minutes or an audio book, have my breakfast, sip on my coffee, and then get out and get after it. I'm going to try to explore some kind of smaller canyons that are closer to camp today. I can elaborate more on that later as well. Now, as far as the MSR reactor, um, I have been extremely pleased with its cold weather performance. So highly recommend that stove and I'll do a deeper review on it when I get back. But anyways, let's cross our fingers and hope we find some ghosts today. So before I head out for the day, I thought I would give a quick update on the snowshoe situation because it's starting to get rather comical. So this is the morning of day four. So this is after three hard days of snowshoeing. Potentially too hard. You be the judge.
like, what is that? How does that even happen? And then look at this thing. Look at it from the back. Like, just destroyed completely. So, I'll be honest, like, part of me, as a safety precaution, when they started getting this bad, I was like, I should probably just turn around. They seem to be bending, but they don't seem to be, like, breaking. So, I'm trying to limit myself from staying away from the crazy stuff. It's the super steep stuff, or when I fall down between boulders and the snowshoes get pinched on both ends and my full weight comes down, that they really tend to take a shit kicking, but... There's really not much else to do. I'm just keeping my eye on them. And if they start to look like they're going to blow completely, I'll just have to pick up and leave. But cross my fingers until then. All right. I've decided to switch up my strategy a little bit this morning for two main reasons. One is adapting my strategy given what I'm finding, and two is adapting to the circumstances. So, number one, I had kind of marked all these locations that looked like really good goat country, and when I get there, they're just so much bigger than they looked when I was e-scouting, and I think that's something that people, you know, don't talk about enough in their e-scouting. Like, you need to, like, take a guess, go out and see, realize the difference between your guess and what was really there, and so these big, like, sprawling vistas that are kind of big, crazy hikes to get to, even if I was to see a goat, it's unattainable. So that initial strategy is not working. <clears throat> Number two, the snowshoes. I just can't cover 10 miles of crazy terrain in these things a day. They're going to fall apart on me. So I'm kind of in this area. I don't know if you'll be able to see it on the camera. But you can see all these like little shoots and little openings. And so I know this sounds kind of dumb, but I'm going to essentially try and still hunt goats, if that makes any sense. We had so much fresh snow yesterday. The snowshoeing is way quieter than it's been all week. So I'm actually just creeping along at a pretty regular pace. And every time I, I kind of come around a little corner or up into a little opening and I see these little shoots open up and they're all over the place. Like here's a couple more. I just take my time and glass them. So the idea is not to cover a shitload of ground. The idea is not to um, get to some big, perfect glassing knob. It's just to take my time, be slow and steady, and pick apart every single little opening that I see. And I don't know, this might fail just as drastically as the other strategy failed, but the other one just simply wasn't working. So we're gonna try something else. All right, continuing to hike in glass, but most of the day has been shot just due to snow and fog. That's basically what I'm looking at right there. Pretty tough to kill a goat if you can't see a goat. All right, it's about 3.30. I got snowed and fogged out. So it's nice because about a quarter mile right behind camp, there's this ridge. And if I can see that ridge, then I can glass. And as you can see, there's nothing, it's just a wall of white. So I decided I might as well make myself useful. Gonna come back here, have a bit of a fire. I don't know if I've conveyed like the wetness of this hunt since about half an hour after I left the truck, I've been soaking wet and I've been soaking wet ever since. The one exception is just before I wake up every morning while I'm still in my sleeping bag, everything's dried out during the night that I'm currently wearing until the moment I unzip the sleeping bag and then the, it like rains inside the tent and I get wet all over again. So given how wet it's been, I thought it would be a great idea to at least be useful and come back here and try and dry some shit out. So time for a fire.
All right, it is the morning of day five. It's my last hunting day. And unfortunately, it is absolutely fog soup out there. I couldn't see more than 50 yards. Certainly can't see up any of the hillsides. So it's 8.30 now. I've been up since seven. I've been checking every half an hour. I'm gonna keep checking every half an hour. If it's no better by 10, I'm just gonna get up and start hunting anyways. It's my last day. Part of me thought about heading out to the truck and then trying to do some road hunting for my last day, but I'm just gonna stick true to my original plan. There's a shitload of snow scheduled for tomorrow. <clears throat> and who knows, fog can lift fast. And maybe if it only lifts for an hour, maybe that's just the hour that I need. So I'm just gonna stick to the game plan. Um, otherwise, like I was gonna say, if I get out there and then that heavy snow hits tomorrow, I've kind of wasted a day hiking for no reason. So I'm gonna stick to the plan, check every half an hour. If it's still fogged in by 10, who cares? We're gonna head out, we're gonna hike, and we're gonna hunt anyways, because it's our last day and I'm sick of sitting in this tent. <laughs> All right, so the fog cleared up uh, to a certain degree. It's still rolling in and out, but it's patchy enough that I'm at least being somewhat effective. Same game plan as yesterday, cover as much ground as possible, focus on the slightly lower elevation stuff that I actually have a chance of getting into if I see something, the little craggy openings and little pockety bluffs that pop out here and there. And I'm trying to get more into the timber um, today and kind of get up to the toe of some of the hills and then kind of glass up and in kind of like this section kind of like right right up there just you never know so at least we're hunting today it would appear our fog free state didn't last very long and we're back to snow and fog soup. All right, I'm fairly certain I just came across a mountain goat uh, track crossing from one slope down across the river onto another slope. I don't know if the camera will pick it up, but it goes from in there, across my tracks, and then up and into there. Now, I made this track two days ago, and I haven't been in this area since. And that's one of the reasons I keep still hunting. I've had this happen before. I was elk hunting um, in the Northern Rockies in 2017, eating dinner on a riverbed. Here are these rocks turn this corner and there's like 18 goats just crossing the river, like 50 meters from where my camp was. I don't know of anything else that would make this track right now. I haven't seen any other sign. It's too big to be any of the little critters that I've seen around and I haven't seen anything else moving in here. So by reasonably, it's probably a mountain goat track. Now, that doesn't really do me any good. There's so much snow dumping that I can't tell, you know, this could have been an hour after I walked here two days ago, or it could have been two hours ago based on the amount of snowfall that's falling. But if nothing else, it supports my strategy of just going slow and glassing and going slow and glassing and almost treating it like a still hunt. Cause you just never know when you might find something. Okay, now I feel like I'm being taunted because there's tracks running parallel with my tracks from two days ago and they've been running that way for the last 100, 150 yards or so. Fuck. Still, doesn't really tell me much other than that I wasn't in the exact right spot at the exact right time by pure luck. So I can't believe this shit. Exactly what I thought was gonna happen did happen. Ugh, just not, ugh, I needed just, okay, so. I was seeing those tracks, right? And I felt like 
all day, I was just gonna look up into the bluffs and just over here somewhere, I was gonna see something. Last two hours, it's just been like a snow fog, just shit show. And uh, I finally get to a spot where I had a bit of cover. So I'm like, oh, I'll rest up here and then start slowly making my way back to camp. It's like two in the afternoon, should be put me back to camp around six. I literally sit down and it was the same as last time. I lift the binos and right in the middle of my binos is a goat, the goat that had been making the tracks. I know for sure because exactly where he's, it's exact, makes sense, makes perfect sense with where he was, with where he was going. I'm not 100% sure. I haven't got a super good look at him, so it could be a her, but the quick look that I got, I was leaning Billy. Obviously, I'm hoping, so I'm, I'm aware that I might be biased about this. What has happened, I'll show you the phone scope footage. What has happened is, I got a little, I got some good shot of him broadside, and then he continued up the hill and kind of went in this little cubby, and he's just been sitting in the cubby. I've got, I'm all set up. I got the spotting scope with the phone scope on him. He's a little bit farther than I'm comfortable with. I'm gonna be honest with you. There is the potential to get over there and cut a couple hundred yards, possibly off the shot. It's hard to say. Um, this is a, a very low percentage play. Like, I know for a fact he's on his way up, not on his way down, and he's not in a super great spot. So there's not a whole lot I can do about it, but it's the second last day and I got nothing else. So I will literally sit here until it is either, you know, when I have to head back to camp to get there before dark, because with these river crossings and shit, I'm not messing around with that in the, in the dark, or he pops out I'm also coming back out again this way tomorrow. So there is a possibility that if he holds up, I could see him again tomorrow. But anyways, at least we found another goat, man. You know, that says something. I was able to plot it out on the map and get to a location that is closer to a range that I'm comfortable with. It's still a little bit farther than I would take a shot, to be honest with you, but at least I'm in the make a play kind of territory. However, there's two things. One, now that I'm looking up there, I don't know if I can actually get up there and get the goat. And until I ascertain that I'm 100% confident I could retrieve this goat, I'm not pulling a trigger regardless of the range I'm at. Number two, as I was making my way over here, fog kind of rolled in. I saw him poke his head out and then the fog rolled out and now I can't see him again. So he could have just tucked back in that little cubby hole where he was or he could have deked up the rest of the face while the fog rolled over and while I was repositioning. I just, I don't know. Um, I'm about a two hour hike from camp, so I don't mind. I could even do this hike in the dark because I've laid tracks this morning and I just need to follow my own tracks with a headlamp. So I'm just gonna sit here as long as I can and wait for him to pop his head out. At this, at this time, it's as much to get footage of him as it is of anything else, because unless he comes out and works to a more advantageous position where I feel confident I can hike up there and, and retrieve his body, I'm not gonna take the shot anyways, but I'd love to get another look at him. Just sit and wait, I guess. Okay, I'm back at camp. It's just about six o'clock. I waited as long as I felt comfortable for that Billy, hoping he was gonna come back out and I never saw him again. And it got to the point where I thought there's probably a decent chance he slipped away on me in the fog. Nice thing was on the way back, I had a chance to kind of recce the backside of the ridge that he was on. And I do feel comfortable that I could get up there and get him. And I found another spot that would maybe knock off even an additional 30 to 40 yards from where that second spot I found. So the, the range I'm comfortable with and I'm comfortable going up in there and getting them. So <clears throat> I have to hike back to the truck tomorrow, but the Billy is on the way to the truck. So there's a slim chance that when I walk past there in the morning, he's going to be up there. And if he is, I'll take a poke, see what happens. If not, them's the brakes. But I just wanted to also add that it's funny how 
just a little thing like that can change the whole mood of a trip. Like I was pretty down on myself until that happened. And I think it's just proof that, you know, I'm not an idiot. I do kind of know what I'm doing a little bit. Um, And you need to be reminded of that sometimes. There's things within our control on a hunt and there's things out of our control on a hunt. The things that were within my control, I did right today. The thing is, even when you do things perfectly on a hunt, you still need a little bit of luck. And I just didn't have that little bit of luck with that guy today. Fog rolled in at a kind of inopportune time. It was a little bit too far. There was just a couple little things that just didn't quite gel up. But for the things that I had control of, I'm happy with how it went down. And there's still a chance that I'm going to see him, you know, tomorrow morning on the way out of here. Temperatures are dropping pretty drastically tonight. I can feel it. It's just way colder than it has been. So I'm going to get camp tidied up, kind of crawl inside the nice warm bag, have some dinner, get well rested, eat all my leftover food that I was saving in case there was an emergency, and then get ready to hike out tomorrow and, and maybe see our, our friend again. All right, camp's all packed up, and we got one thing left to do. It finally happened. This is 100% broken. You can see it is thrashed. <clears throat> so what we're gonna do, we have one tent peg, about 10 feet of Dyneema cord made out of Cuban fiber, and a shitload of duct tape. So I'm gonna do my best to put something on here at least to hold it together for the hike out. Um, and hopefully it doesn't break. I'll show you the finished product. So we're midway done the repair. I've got, I just put a little bit of duct tape on each end of the tent peg just to hold it steady. Wrap the shit out of it with the Dyneema. And now I'm just gonna duct tape the whole thing to kind of protect the Dyneema from the abrasion of going in and out of the snow and up against rocks and that kind of stuff. Again, I'm not looking for this to add structural stability to the snowshoe. I just don't want this entire back piece to pop off. Because if this other side breaks and I lose like a third of my snowshoe, I'm gonna be in a world of hurt. So I just really want enough stability to hold the snowshoe together for the hike out. All right, she's all done. Surprisingly stronger than I thought it was gonna be. So let's cross our fingers, it's time to go home. So I just made it to the last mile and a half before the truck, which is kind of this old grown in road trail thing. And somebody's driven a sled, a snowmobile, all the way from the road up to here. They had a big fire and then drove back. So I get to walk out the last mile and a half on somebody's Sled track, oh my God. Thankful for the little things in life right about now. I am dead. All right, time for everybody's favorite part of the film, the introspective drive home, where I wax philosophical about my failings over the last week. I'm only, I'm only half kidding, actually. I do, I like this part. And I actually tend to think about this part during the hunt, like when things occur to me that I should probably bring that up or I should probably talk about it. I feel like it's my last chance to kind of have a say on, on how things went or share how I feel about how things went. So, elephant in the room, I did not kill a goat. And if you've watched any of my other content, you'll realize that I'm big on personal responsibility and on, on honesty about the purpose of why I go out there and do these things. So yes, my ultimate priority was to kill a goat and I failed to do so. That being said, I feel really good about how things went. The one decent opportunity I had was a direct result of the strategy that I'd planned and executed. I don't think there was a whole lot I could have done differently in that situation. Uh, sometimes you just need a little bit of luck, and I, I didn't have any luck in that situation. Now, that being said, there was also a fairly important secondary purpose for this trip, and that was to test both myself and my gear in an extended 
winter backcountry situation. This is the longest I've ever gone solo in the backcountry in the middle of winter. And I, and I, and I made it and I'm happy about that because it was not an easy thing to do. It was difficult to plan for. It was difficult to execute. There was a whole bunch of things that made it difficult and I was able to pull it off. So I'm pretty happy with myself in that regard. And the other reason I bring that up is if that had not have been part of this trip and if it had been solely to kill a goat, then I would have likely pulled out after day three and gone and looked for another drainage or another area that potentially held more goats. But it was more important at that time to test myself and my gear for the continuous single trip as opposed to breaking it up with like a break at the truck or a hotel in the middle because that kind of changes the dynamic of everything. And I'm actually glad I stayed because it was on the second last day that I did see the goat that I wanted to kill. So yes, I failed to kill a goat, but I was also stay able to stay in the back country for my longest solo midwinter trip yet. So I'm gonna chalk that up as a win. Now, would I recommend this trip? That's a difficult question. For the average person, no, I wouldn't. You're probably not gonna enjoy it. It was pretty shitty from like an objective perspective. If you're the kind of person that gets off on testing your limits and seeing what you're, you're capable of and you don't mind being by yourself for extended periods of time, I think this is an interesting challenge. This was the hardest physical hunt I've ever had in my life, by far. And there was a bunch of different reasons for that. The weather, the snow primarily. Um, and I don't think you get that in a lot of other hunts. Like I was trying to think on the way home, how many other true winter DIY hunts have I seen on YouTube? I don't even think there's that many. Like I, I, I can't think of a guy in snowshoes hunting right now. I'm sure they're up there, but it's not like elk hunting or mule deer hunting. Like these are generally enjoyable things to do. So clearly lots of guys want to do them. I also think it's a bit of survivorship bias in that it's way easier to film those things. It was very challenging to film this hunt. And I don't know if doing that on a production scale for a television show or a really high end YouTube channel, it would be a very difficult thing to do. Um, but I also think it's because the snow and the weather make it such a challenging psychological hunt that like not just not a lot of people want to do it because now you're you're kind of doubling up on challenge. You have the challenge of the hunt, but you also have the challenge of just the terrain and just getting around and everything else. So I, I, I think I would be very cautious about recommending this hunt to somebody. You'd have to be very experienced and really know what you were getting into. Um, but I think there is a hell of a good time to be had if this is your thing. I've kind of alluded to this next point a couple of times during the hunt. But in your mind, when you're preparing for these things, you think the hunt is going to be, like the challenge of the hunt is gonna be some big, sexy, grand gesture, like charging up the last 300 meters of a summit so that you can get a chance at a goat just before dark and your lungs are gonna be burning and your, your, your legs are on fire and everything hurts, but you're pushing it and it's very dramatic and cinematic and it's like, that shit's there every now and then, but that's not the true challenge of the hunt. The true challenge of the hunt is the grind of it all. And that was especially apparent with this hunt. Like, it just never ended. You were always mildly or severely uncomfortable. You're cold, wet, and tired kind of from the moment you leave the truck. Like my pack with rifle weighed 81 pounds. From the first step in snowshoes with that 81 pounds on my back, I was like, oh no, <laughs> this, is, this could go really bad. Like your just legs are just instantly sore. So again, it's not the big sexy grand gesture challenge, it's this grind. And I think the more I do these things, the easier they get because I realize that's what it is. Like, 
you just sink into it and you just accept the fact that, yeah, I'm just gonna be mildly to moderately uncomfortable for the next X amount of days. And if you can just accept that as part of your reality and then operate within it, it's like it doesn't even exist. It just becomes part of the background. It becomes part of the landscape. Oh, there's that mountain over there. Oh, I'm tired. Oh, that's a nice river. Oh, I'm cold. Like you note it, you appreciate it, and you move on. It doesn't impact your actual activity in a negative way. But I think it's a bit of a bit of a mind game to get yourself into that place where you're that okay with it. So, the big question, would I do it again? Without hesitation, the answer is yes. On that hike out, all I wanted in the world was to get out of there. I, I was like angry, like just on that walk out because it's just yeah, so wet and so cold and so tired. I was just like, get my ass to the truck. And I'm not kidding. It wasn't two hours after I got to the truck. I was driving down the road and it was like, I don't know if anybody's ever quit smoking or quit drinking or quit anything and had like that like almost nostalgic, remorseful kind of sense of withdrawal, like a longing for something. Like you you, you want it so bad you, you miss it. I wasn't two hours down the road and that hit me like a wall. I was like, I just want to go back. There's something about the intensity back there, just you by yourself against the mountains and the elements it's like kind of scary, kind of anxious, kind of invigorating, and it's so pure. Like, I was remarking to myself on the drive home last night, I was like, it felt like I was in there for a year. Like, I came out and I forgot about COVID. It hadn't even occurred to me that COVID was a thing. And I go to the gas station and there's this sign to wear masks, and it like literally took me a half a second to process it. And I was like, oh right, there's a whole pandemic sweeping the globe right now that I had not even thought about. And it was like, I want back in there. I want that intensity. So that leads me to my final point. Another side benefit of this trip was testing kind of my gear, my endurance, and a whole bunch of other stuff for a two week solo sheep hunt I'm gonna do this summer. That's kind of my next big hunt. We'll do some spring bear between now and then, but that's like a fun hunt. And everything, all my gear I took worked. My endurance was right up there. I think I've learned an 80 pound pack is about my limit. I feel very comfortable that I could be climbing mountains and setting up camp for sheep with an 80 pound pack on my back. And if I'm gonna go in two weeks solo, by the time you add up food and, and, and necessities and other stuff, like you just, especially because I'm filming my own stuff. If I wasn't filming my own stuff, I could bet you I could keep it down to 65 or 70. But by the time you throw in the cameras and the batteries, and the SD cards, and just all the various tripods and stuff you bring in, it's an extra 10 to 15 pounds to film. But anyways, all that stuff worked. Anyways, I was able to learn a lot about what I was physically capable of and what my gear was physically capable of. And so I feel I'm extremely well prepared for the sheep hunt in a few months. And already I can feel myself longing for that like intense solitude. Like I want to be climbing the mountains by myself, somewhat in fear for my life, not quite sure when the next time I'm going to talk to someone is. I don't know how else to put it. It is an addictive sensation. Like. Yeah, there's just, there's nothing else like it. So, I don't know. That's all I got. I'm done. I got no more talking. Um, I'm going to enjoy the rest of my peaceful drive home, reminiscing about the hunt that I just had and already making plans for the next one I'm going to go on. Thank you very much for your time and attention. If there's anything I can do, let me know. If you want to engage with this content in any way, it's deeply appreciated. As always, you know how to get a hold of me. So, this is another one. Signing out.